joining us. Welcome to another Learn at UOBM session. Today's webinar topic is Rate Hikes, Inflation and You. Uh, so sit back and relax. We'll start the session now. Hi, everybody. I'm Bart, and I'll be your host today for the Learn at UOB AM session. Before we kickstart today's session, let's go through some of the familiar housekeeping matters. Please note that this is a public webinar and it will be recorded. The chat box is available. If you have any connectivity issues, you can raise them to the Zoom host and my colleagues will help you. Polls will appear on screen for your selections and the results will be shared. Click on the Q&A icon to ask questions throughout the session. This is very important as I will be picking up questions from the Q&A to ask our panelists. Click on the like button to upvote questions raised in the Q&A section and scan the QR codes with your phone to access the feedback form and download page or click on the links available in the chat box later. So the agenda for today is uh, the introduction to UOB AM, the intro to our speakers, then go to the webinar proper, rate heights, inflation and you, and then we'll end off with a Q&A section. For those who are familiar with us, thank you for joining our webinar today. For those who are new, welcome. So who are we? Uh, we are UOB Asset Management. We are a leading regional asset manager with over 35 years of experience. We are committed to promoting investment excellence, driving innovation, and embracing sustainability. At UOB AM, we invest for profit and purpose while shaping a better world for future generations. As of 31st of January, we have more than 35 years of investment experience and we have 100 investment professionals across nine markets in Asia, managing our clients' 37.2 billion worth of assets and while winning more than 300 awards since 1986. A quick introduction of what is UOBM Invest. UOBM Invest is a digital platform offering investors guided and personalized investment service. It is available as a mobile application for personal investing and as an online web portal for businesses. So why should you invest with us? Because we have been doing this for more than 35 years and you can have our institutional fund management expertise at your fingertips. UOB invest, UOBM Invest also allows customized investing driven by technology and at UOBM, we invest for profit and purpose while shaping a better future for the, uh, for the future generations. <laughs> With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers and for today. Kun Hao is the head of market strategy in the global economics and market research team at UOB, where he formulates forecasts and market views for FX, commodities, and interest rates. He has more than 20 years of experience, and he, is, he actively participates in various investment seminars across the APEC region. He graduated with honors from NUS, and he was awarded the Financial Sector Development Fund Postgraduate Scholarship from MAS. Hi, Kun Hao. Thank you for being with us today. And I'll introduce the second speaker for today. And Tony, Tony joined us in 2008 and is currently the head of multi-asset strategy unit. With over 30 years of investment experience, he spearheads efforts towards achieving the team's objectives in monitoring global markets, forming the in-house view of likely market outlooks and performance, making investment recommendations, and developing and managing a range of asset allocation products. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, Bart. Right. Okay, so let me uh, start off. Uh, it's good to see you, Kunal. Thanks for joining us again. I always enjoy talking to you. So uh, I guess for everybody on the call today, uh, we thought this would be a good time to, to catch up. Uh, 2022 is proving to be a, a very challenging year for investments. And uh, uh, it's quite a confusing year. I know I've talked to a fair number of clients and the type of feedback I get is sort of uh, a, a clients who are sounding fairly perplexed that in a year like this, where actually things like we're, we're, we're moving past the COVID problems quite well, the world is reopening, the global economies are doing pretty well, uh, consumers are doing better, the economies are strong enough. 
and yet markets are doing so badly. And uh, this contrasts to you know the past couple of years, where I know I spoke to many clients who were somewhat surprised that in a world where everything was shut down and the global economies were doing so badly, generally markets were doing quite well. And so in, in, I think uh, I, I've, I've spoken to a fair number of uh, clients who are just sort of perplexed that none of these market moves make any sense. And so uh, hopefully Kunhao and I can uh, help put some rationale and explanation to, to what's going on in these markets. So th the first thing I would say is, um, as I try to explain what's, what's happening uh, this year, is that, uh, you know, at this, I think many investors are surprised. I've spoken to like a, a number of strategists, fund houses all over the world. And at the start of the year, it was really a very consensus view that 2002 was shaping up to look pretty good for investing. Uh, as, as everyone knows, the world had, was moving past the problems of COVID. Expectations is that as things opened up, the global economy should be, should be strong. Corporate profits would then be strong, and this should uh, produce fairly solid equity markets that, that benefit from rising corporate profits. The complication, oh, and then I, I think through the course of the year, I mean, I've obviously there's been ongoing events in terms of the, the war in Ukraine, the lockdowns in China, and that all has complicated things to, to some degree. But I think at the heart of it um, for 2022, the main problem has been about inflation. And inflation is something that, uh, you know, uh, is, is sometimes, um, sort of problematic in either direction. And, and as a matter of fact, the way I would describe almost like the last decade is that we've had almost too low inflation and really economists around the world, if there was a concern they had, it, it was that a lot of the developed markets, Europe and, um, and the US were increasingly turning Japanese in their outlook on how low inflation was getting and that this deflationary problem that Japan was never able to solve was increasingly becoming a problem around the world. And then this year, we're seeing this return to inflation. And in many aspects, this could be good. This is breaking out of this deflationary problems that uh, the world has had for the last decade. But it quickly became problematic. Um, it's it's uh, the the inflation problems were a result that uh, the consumers around the world were rebounding, and that's a good thing. That spending is healthy, and everyone is is doing better and spending well. Uh, but the first problem was that you know the production around the world of all the goods that people want to buy wasn't quite keeping up with the rebound as the world is reopening we weren't quite producing enough cars that everyone wanted to buy. We weren't quite producing, you know, all the, the chips that uh, all these goods need. And um, we had sort of slowed down building houses for a couple of years as we got locked down with COVID and demand for buying houses is really strong. And so we're getting all these inflation pressures, which for the most part is kind of more just a, we need supply to catch up with demand. And as the world reopens, that should happen. But it is happening too slowly in 2022. And I think, you know, the hopes that we had that at the beginning of the year, that the reopenings would allow supply to catch up with demand is proving to happen too slowly. And so I think the real ultimate dilemma that markets are facing, and we're seeing it both in the stock markets and the bond markets, the both stock and bond markets, I mean, depend which markets you measure, but broadly are roughly down 15% this year. And that's that's a pretty ugly year. Um, it's, it's ironic that, you know, uh, things are doing worse now in, in terms of the investment markets than during COVID. And I'd say the main problem now is that because this inflation is remain fairly persistent and the re reopening of the world isn't solving it fast enough, it's putting the pressure on central banks and in particular the US Fed to get control of inflation. And therefore they have had to surprise the market in how hawkish they are becoming in how quickly they will have to raise rates. And because supply isn't able to catch up, it, it looks increasingly likely that what the Fed has to do is raise interest rates to the point where they're getting demand to slow down and not be so 
overheated as it is now. And so both stock and bond markets don't like the outlook of what this implies um, for, for bond markets, obviously rising rates uh, aren't good. And for the stock markets, if the Fed's trying to cool off the economy and keep things from getting overheated, then that takes away some of the growth outlook that it uh, was originally kind of optimistic about. Um, so how about, look, that, that's sort of my summary of, I think, what, what the world's facing right now. And I think the dilemma of where the Fed is in terms of needing to address the inflation problems and how, how aggressive they'll have to go. So how about, let me pause there and uh, invite Kunal to share your thoughts on how you think uh, things have been going this year. And I guess in particular, what the UOB Bank economics team and your thoughts are around what the Fed is going to do this year. Thank you, Tony. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So in other words, it's, you know, as what Tony says is basically inflation, inflation and inflation. So, so um, we did have a discussion before this about how we're going to couch, you know, this next hour of discussion. Uh, and we are very conscious that, you know, there's a, quite a bit of volatility going through financial markets and we do not want to sound too negative. We want to balance the discussion on both sides of the coin. So, so what we agree upon is that, you know, there's this good cop versus bad cop regime, right? Uh, Tony's the more loving person. So, so he'll be able to give you the, the more uh, optimistic and constructive outlook. And, and I'll be the, the guy who breaks the bad news and highlight you know, front and center where interest rates are going and the harsh reality of what we can expect this year so that we're all informed of you know, the volatility uh, that is going through and why it's happening. So as what Tony says is inflation, 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 and it's forcing the Fed and pretty much every other central bank in the world to play catch up. So I'm going to show a few charts here uh, just to highlight you know, what's happening on the interest rate front. And, and basically, our view is this, and I think there should be no surprises. Uh, if you have been following you know, the messaging from Jay Powell, from different Fed officials, uh, you know that the rate hikes are coming and you know that the rate hikes will be fast and furious. And, and you can see that there's been quite a bit of uh, criticism on Jay Powell lately. Uh, he's, he's pretty much shaping out to be public enemy number one. Uh, he's doing his job, of course, and he is guiding the Fed to front load the rate hikes aggressively. So just, uh, we saw that, you know, recently we saw that US CPI, you know, is about 830 and a little bit lower than the month before, but still above 8% and still very, very elevated. Tonight, we're going to have PPI numbers and pretty much very high as well. And that reinforces the urgency of the rate hikes from the Fed. So our view is that the Fed is going to do another 50 in June, another 50 in July. And in fact, this should not be surprising to all of you because that's the messaging that Jay Powell, that all his lieutenants are all pushing out there. They're building consensus that we'll get 50 in June and 50 in July, which means by the turn of the middle of the year, you're going to have another full 1% bump in front-end interest rates. And now you can appreciate what, what Tony has been saying that, you know, despite seemingly getting past the COVID difficulty, uh, financial markets are not having a good time lately, simply because the realization that the rate hikes are coming and front and center. And after the 50 in you know, just recently, you're going to have another one whole percent bump, you know, by July. And, and we see, you know, pretty much every FOMC meeting will be live for the rest of this year. And Fed fund rates will pretty much rise to about two half by the end of the year. And early next year, another two lifting Fed fund rates up to three. So, so this, this is a, you know, pain uh, adjustment phase that financial markets needs to go through to adjust to higher levels of funding rate, higher levels of bordering rate, higher levels of interest rate. Pretty much that's what this is. And it's all because inflation has been showing up to be much more persistent, much more widespread. Now, you can see the impact on interest rates. This is a chart of front-end money market rates in the US, three-month LIBOR, 
three months treasury bill, so on and so forth. Um, again, don't look at the numbers. What this is, is we're back to pre-COVID levels, late 2019, early 2020 levels. So for those of us who are still hoping that rates will go back to zero where we were, you know, 2020 and 2021, the harsh reality is that was the abnormal phase because of aggressive QE and monetary policy easing, and we are out of it. We are back to pre-COVID levels, right? And rates are only going to climb higher, right? Two, two and a half, the money markets, you know, back to where things were in 2018 and 2019. And of course, in the back end, your long-term borrowing costs have all jumped, right? 10-year treasury yields have popped 3%. And that's a huge move because we were at one half at the start of the year. So in just five months, we have doubled from one half to three. And, and there are whispers now that we may get to three half if this inflation you know, problem is not well controlled. So, so our forecast is by the end of the year, we will see about 3.35 and potentially early next year as high as 350, 360. So that's the risk we should be cognizant of. And, and as a result, no surprises, if you look at all the indicators, financial market conditions are tightening, right? And at the same time as the Fed hike interest rates, the Fed is also going to do QT, basically shrinking back its balance sheet. And it's going to start to do so in June at a markedly faster pace than what Janet Yellen has been doing back you know, in 2017. So what all this is happening is now. Now, Tony said about the pain that markets are going through, equities and fixed income market. Your, your main driver of this is, of course, higher inflation, higher interest rates. Now, at the same time, concurrently, you, know, you have, of course, higher commodity prices that adds to you know, rising business costs, rising manufacturing costs, rising shipping costs, so on and so forth. At the same time, you also have a much stronger US dollar. And I'm sure many of you are following, you know, all this development very closely. You would notice that since the war of Ukraine started, right, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, pretty much the euro has dropped, you know, the Japanese yen has dropped, the renminbi has dropped, and of course, our own Singapore dollar, despite the MAS double tightening, has also weakened as well against the dollar. So there is outright, you know, omnipotent US dollar strength. And, and that adds to business costs as well, because as we all know, global trade, commerce, it's all, you know, price in US dollar. And, and higher dollar obviously means a much more larger importing bill, right, for those of us, you know, in domestic currency terms. So, so this year has shaped up to be a difficult year, to be a challenging one. And, and it remains to be seen, you know, how markets will adjust, but appreciate that, you know, uh, the, the drivers out there, higher inflation, aggressive front-loading fat rate heights, higher commodity prices, and a stronger dollar. Now, moving out of this, I want to highlight, you know, a customer has just told me you know, this morning that, uh, is it just the Fed that's hiking? No, it is not just the Fed. It's pretty much every other central bank out there. The Fed is leading this rate hiking cycle. Yes, it's the most aggressive, yes, but practically every other central bank out there is trying to play catch up, trying to control the inflation monster. Bank of England has hiked, RBA has hiked, RBNZ has hiked, South Korea has hiked, India has hiked yesterday, Malaysia has hiked as well. And our MAS has also tightened monetary policy. So, so you find that rates are going up everywhere and, and it's not coming back down. So just you know, appreciate this risk uh, front and center. So, so on that note, um, I hope you know, I've highlighted the unpleasant risks and that we are aware of what's happening and, and, and up to you know, Tony to soothe our nerves from here on. Back to you, Tony. Okay, so how about uh, just, just a, a follow-up on that. Uh, so the Fed has, has really only hiked twice. They did a 25 basis point hike and then a 50 basis point hike. But in the real economy, interest rates have already adjusted, right? In, in the US, if you want to... Um, take out a mortgage for a new housing loan. Already the rates were, they were a little bit below 3% um, at the end of last year. And they're already roughly 5.5% now. So in the real economy, uh, even though the Fed has only hiked rates a couple times, it's really getting 
um, adjusted through the economy very quickly and it's affecting, you know, day-to-day -day operations. If you want to buy a car, you want to buy a house, uh, the, the rates have already changed. And yet the economy, all the data we're getting is still fairly robust. Um, consumer spending is pretty resilient. The manufacturing PMIs are still pretty solid. Um, what what are you thinking, Kunhao, is is going to happen um, as as the central banks do these pretty aggressive uh, rate hike? Path? So so there's there's two things that's happening with respect to to growth. Now, first, uh, we need to appreciate that despite you know the growth downgrade, the worry about China slowdown. We'll talk a bit more about that later. I think that warrants a closer discussion. Um, overall, across uh, our part of the world, Southeast Asia, ASEAN in particular, generally growth as a region should still be stronger than last year. And, and we are still you know, uh, forecasting stronger growth for Vietnam, stronger growth for most of the ASEAN economies for this year compared to last year. And more importantly, Singapore, right? MAS, MTI is still uh, sticking to their guns for 3 to 5% GDP growth. And, and that's reasonably strong for Singapore. Remember that you know, there was a time uh, in the in the late you know 2010s we are supposed to get used to one to two percent growth. So three to five percent is good. So despite all the fierce growth in our region, region is still going to be reasonably healthy this year. Now the second thing is, unfortunately, as a result of these disruptions, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and Chinese you know slowdown, that there will be a what I call you know a whole range of growth outlooks across the world. The world is no longer a uniform space, right? US, if you know, the Fed is able to generate a soft landing, should still go by 3% GDP this year. And that's remarkable for a big economy. Now, the problem is Europe is going through a very uncertain patch because front and center, it's getting the collateral risks from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So naturally, you know, Europe's growth will be much more slower and there are whispers of, you know, technical recession in Germany uh, as it is. China, of course, is slowing down and our region is doing quite well, Southeast Asia. So, so there is this, what you call, difference and diversity in growth and it's longer, no longer uniform. And, and that makes policy setting. You can imagine if you're a central banker, you know, or a finance minister, very difficult to coordinate because... Your country may be overheating compared to other countries, but yet you still need to hike interest rates pretty fast. So that's that dilemma in policy setting this year. And then um, let, let's let's mention China just to recap uh, our thoughts on the world before we get into sort of comments on investments and positioning. But um, uh, in particular for China, then um, it stood out. It's it's at odds with the rest of the world in terms of whereas most of the world is reopening, China is still locking down, um, and also its policy divergence is still um, pretty significant from the rest of the world. Uh, what what are you and the economics team that you will be thinking in terms of uh, China right now? So needless to say, you know the official so called the, the Chinese government's five half percent GDP target this year is going to be very difficult to obtain, right? Uh, our view is that it's going to be sub five. And of course, if you've been following some of the much more, how should I say, pessimistic news out there, it can even be in the low force for, for growth in China. Um, the, the concern here is that, you know, uh, amidst the growth slowdown, uh, you have various, how should I say, domestic issues. And of course, you know, front and center is the ongoing rolling lockdowns across the key cities, manufacturing hubs, and parts across China as they try to control COVID-19. Uh, secondly is, of course, you see a slowdown consequently as a result you know, of consumer spending, of real estate sales, so and so forth. And, and that doesn't build confidence. Now, now, I've been asked point blank, where do you see as a turning point for China? And my very honest comment is this. Now, until China reopens, meaning the borders, meaning we can now go to China to engage our clients in China, right? And, and the Chinese tourists can now travel out to our part of the world, generating you know, uh, more consumption. Until borders reopen, it's hard to see a sustainable you know, growth recovery. So, so until then, you know, 
uh, we just got to be mindful of, of this risk in China. Now, having said that, there is one very, very good, how should I say, um, adjustment mechanism, and, and that's basically the currency. You notice that the renminbi has weakened uh, quite a fair bit over the past month against the dollar, 630, 40, 50, 60, 670 now against the dollar. That's quite a significant move in percentage terms. And, and in the FX world, you know, uh, whenever the economy goes through a very rough, very painful patch, the currency will weaken for various reasons. And that, you know, is your, your, your basically adjustment mechanism to try to rebalance trade, rebalance competitiveness, and, and help to right the economy a little bit. So, so, you know, it may look very gloom and doom now, but I think, you know, the changes are happening and that's good. And clearly a little bit of renminbi weakness is, is very powerful for the cost for the growth slowdown in China going on now. Okay, so then let's, uh, before we wrap up our first section here, let's, uh, let me share some investment thoughts. And uh, I also had some uh, questions just about your thoughts on ASEAN. So firstly, just for um, broad investment thoughts, um, firstly, I, I, I mean, I think the reality is um, in terms of near-term positioning, it's, it's an environment where you need to be cautious as interest rates go up, that's affecting bond funds and bond fund performance. And, um, you know, within our strategies, we're trying to make sure we're careful on how much exposure we have, on being careful on duration, on trying to hedge whatever interest rate risk we have. And those are the types of things we're trying to be cautious around fixed income. And then likewise on equities, although this is generally a, a world of uh, pretty solid economic growth and, and that should result in earnings growth, we are in an environment where the Fed is trying to slow that down. They're, they're dealing with this problem that there's just too many consumers trying to buy more stuff than the world can produce right now. And it's trying to cool that off. And that, that creates pressure on the, the opportunities in this growth outlook and therefore equities are pricing in a more cautious view. And that's probably not gonna change on a dime uh, very, very soon. Uh, it's gonna take some months at least to, to work through this. Um, and so therefore, I think investors should be aware that markets aren't completely crazy in pricing things the way they are. This is just a, a complicated year, and uh, this is the, some of the things that need to get priced in in a year like this. Um, I think on a more longer, medium-term basis, I, I do have some words of, you know, uh, just reasons not to be overly alarmed in an investment world like this. Um, uh, the first point I would just broadly make is a world where demand is too strong is better than investing in a world where demand is is too weak. Like you know, Indeed. so even like in the midst of like that COVID period or even the financial crisis in two thousand and eight, those are times where we were really worried. You know, well, are enough people going to be alive to buy goods um, in the midst of the pandemic? Or in two thousand eight, are the banking system going to be functional enough that? that I could take out a housing loan and uh, buy property. Those were really, you know, uh, strong, uh, dangerous periods where we just didn't know if demand was gonna be there. What we're dealing with now is just more of a complicated world where demand is perfectly solid and good, but it's, it's we're struggling to balance what the world can produce and how much we're demanding. And that's something that has to get worked out. But that's not, uh, you know, an existentially like, scary existence of uh, are we all going to be okay next year? This is perfectly sort of solid trajectory for years to come. And in fact, the world has sort of broken out of the doldrums of the last decade that have been sort of almost Japan-like in its deflationary element. Uh, in some ways, mm -hmm. this is a a more solid uh, expansion world than than we've seen for a little while, and that that's fundamentally a good thing. It's going to take some time to adjust interest rates, get the economy and, and you know, factories of the world producing properly again. But once we get to that state, um, it's actually a fairly solid world for investing and actually even more solid than we've seen in the past decade. And so just to spell it out, um, you know, a, a more reflationary world where obviously we don't want inflation too high. That's leading to the problems we're getting right now. But if we just get moderately healthy in inflation, then that creates a world where sort of um, earnings that are uh, that are nominal in nature they they just go up more naturally and more solid, and equities can respond to that. 
Um, and then likewise for fixed income, while fixed income funds have been behave, I mean, had a lot of struggle as we are adjusting these interest rates, but already the yields on bond funds are actually much more attractive than we've seen in years. So the in the internal bonds that we're holding in these funds, they're they are seeing yields uh, for corporate bonds of like four and a half to five percent, and that's for really good quality, you know, A-rated uh, bonds. And therefore, um, you know, once we get to a period where things are more settled, both the yield we'll get from these fixed income funds and the earnings growth we get in equities should actually be fairly solid on a more medium term basis. We just have some periods to work through before we get there. So that'd be my sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, silver lining on all this chaos we've been seeing at the, the first half of 2022. And then I think it's also true that, you know, I think Kunhao, you mentioned not all of the world's the same. And one area that actually has been performing better than most of the world has been ASEAN. And I know you've been covering the research uh, there. So I don't, did, you, did you have any uh, points you can highlight in what you're seeing there? So before ASEAN, just want to build on your point about, you know, how should I say uh, it's, things are, you know, good to be reflationary. If you remember when, when COVID first hit, right, uh, back in, in you know, first quarter of 2020, uh, our discussion was, will the Fed really go negative, right? Will the Fed follow the ECB and the BOJ? And then, you know, uh, will we have a world where, you know, pretty much all three major economies in the world, Europe, US, and Japan, have negative bond yields, right? And that's a very scary thought, right? And lo and behold, you know, in just barely two years, we have flipped completely the other way now. Right. Uh, there's also whispers about now whether Japan and Europe can stay easy in terms of monetary policy for long because they also have, you know, the fires of inflation that is starting to to show up pretty, you know, slightly more obviously. So, so I think it's a good thing. Think about it this way, right? Uh, you know, uh, I love to have a hot, hot hot cup of coffee every morning, right? Nobody wants a cold cup of coffee, right? You need a warm cup of coffee to start your day. So it's good to be reflationary. Um, on ASEAN, now the team has, has done a lot of good work on ASEAN. And I think, you know, we are a ASEAN centric, centric bank UOB. Um, the, the, the good thing is, I want to emphasize this. Uh, you may have heard this many times, but it is worth mm -hmm. emphasizing because our part of the region, in terms of trade, in terms of growth, is still expected to perform better and stay healthy compared to last year. And there's one key common denominator, which is the RCEP, the new trade pact, which pretty much is now operational and basically, you know, entrenches ASEAN as the focal point. If you look at the map, ASEAN, the 10 countries are in the middle of the RCEP, China, Japan, South Korea at the top, Australia and New Zealand are at the bottom, and pretty much we're the gateway for the Chinese trade to flow down and of course for trade from down under to flow up. And this is a very important thing that sets us apart from the, the huge uncertainty going on in Europe right now because of Ukraine. And, and of course, you know, the other regions do not have such a strong you know, uh, trade uh, regime that encapsulates intra-regional trade. So, so that is a good thing. At least we're in a very, very strong part of the world in terms of trade. And that offers a much needed stability amidst all this uncertainty. So, so yes, don't, don't forget you know, some of the positive driving forces out there. And okay. your hot cup of coffee in the morning. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks, Kanao. Um, I think uh, we have some colleagues online, I think Roger and Bart, who also have uh, some things to highlight about our, uh, our UOB Invest. Uh, Roger, did you want to do that now? And then I think we do questions after that. Sure, thanks, thanks Tony, and thanks Kunal. Hi, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Roger, I'm part of the UBM digital team as well. So, so before I go on to uh, you know, uh, sharing a little bit more of the UBM Invest uh, corporate and retail, I just want to do a simple poll right now. Uh, can we have the poll questions being pulled up as well? Yeah, so maybe just take a few moments to answer some of these pertaining questions that is, uh, you know, that why you're on top of your mind right now.
Okay, we can see there's a clear leader emerging soon. Okay, great. So it seems like most of the audience today are actually preferring to take a wait and see approach. And uh, before investing, I, I mean, that, that I mean, everybody has that uh, own opinion and all that, but uh, looking at a close second, right, there is an opportunity to invest uh, because I hold a long-term view of that. So, so these are some of the, uh, why I guess in, in trying to put it in context is after sharing from, uh, from, from Kunhao and also from Tony is that uh, I think both of them have brought up quite uh, valid points in terms of what we are right now and where we are right now in terms of the markets. And, and I guess uh, there's always never been a good time to invest and there's never been a time to, to look at how things are. While you know, uh, Tony tried to soothe the thing and then trying to bring us out of the positive points that we have highlighted and we've gone out, you know, trying to showcase in terms of what we are right now, uh, you know, if the front loading on the interest rates, the rising commodity prices and the USD strengthening and all that, I, I guess we, we have to come to a certain point whereby uh, it is quite impossible to time the market. And, and, and what you have seen right now in the, uh, on the screen right now is that uh, as, at UB, invest itself right while we are while we have been an investment house for more than 30 years and and, and with over 90 over uh, professionals uh, looking at the, the um, managing monies on on your end right uh, I, I think it's, it's good that uh, we, while we try to time uh, or, or, or it's impossible to time the market itself we, it's always important to be the time in the market itself so so i just at this note right, i just wanted to highlight that for UOB am invest retail uh, which is the retail app that but have shared earlier uh, we have actually launched our e gyro uh, which is actually uh, helping our, cli our clients to actually to start a regular savings plan, RSP, as quickly as possible. And, and with that, right, we actually are running a promo right now, which is getting up to $50 credit when you set up a regular savings plan via eGiro. The reason why I decided to bring up this point uh, really, really relates back to what uh, Kunhao have and Tony have shared, uh, that there's always never been a good time to invest. It's always about getting the time in the market and also, also, and also getting uh, staying invested as well. So from the poll, I think from what we have seen, right, people are taking a wait and see approach. People are also trying to take it as an opportunity to invest. So while you're trying to gravel between the two sides, how do you see the markets go and how do I take action right now, right? And, and what is very pertaining to you is that you want to stay invested, but you know you don't want to, you know, getting caught out on, on the both ends and all that. So, so going on an RSP probably would be a better idea because that actually, you know, is a consistent way of uh, investing and then removing all the emotions from there as well. So uh, let me just quickly run through uh, some of the questions that we have for today. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to also quickly highlight in terms of, I think there was uh, a point whereby Kuna mentioned in terms of how the businesses will be affected. And, and I guess uh, there were three main uh, sub points that I think uh, the, the, the audience have shared uh, or from Kunhao and, and Tony as well. Number one, supply chain bottleneck that we have seen from the recent war in, in uh, Russia and Ukraine and also with the China lockdown as well. Number two, because of that, the rising cost of materials due to the supply chain bottleneck. And thirdly, the interest expenses on loans are also going higher as well. So maybe uh, either Tony or Kunhao could actually take this question. How about let me make a, a first macro point and then uh, invite Kunal to join mm -hmm. too. So uh, I think one of the, the complications for, for businesses out there is this, this cycle is really complicated. So usually, um, uh, I mean, so the Fed is on this path where they want to cool off demand. They want to slow down growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually for businesses, the, the answer is when um, growth is slowing down, then you want to make sure your inventories aren't overloaded. Uh, you want to start slowing your production right away. But this is a more complicated time. This is where supply is short, right? So if you're producing cars, for example, actually the problem is there's too few. So it's it's actually a really complex time for businesses. Um, costs are rising, labor shortages are abound, um, and yet uh, demand is needed, but you don't want to get overextended with expensive, um, high cost inventory. So it's a really difficult balancing act that I think it's going to be challenging for businesses. If, and it's just one of the overarching headaches of, of why this is such a complicated period, even though it feels like it should be better as the world's reopening. Um, I, I would, I guess the main point though, is it, I don't think businesses can take the usual playbook of just saying, this is, this is a normal recession. We just slow everything down, lay off workers. Uh, actually part of what we need is that those, those cars could be sold, uh, um, 
And therefore, it's a balancing act of just managing costs, getting productions to right levels. And I, I just think it's going to be a challenge to, to get all the balancing right. I, I'll stop there. How about you, Kunal? Would you have more advice? So I, I think, how should I say, it will be an understatement, uh, as what Tony says, to say that things are much more complicated this time. Um, and, and that supply chain disruption, the commodities disruption is front and center. Uh, I mean, every customer we speak to, you know, in any industry will, will have a, a, you know, a shortage of, you know, a, a manufacturing part or in commodities. That is definitely the case. And, and if you remember, you know, it used to be, there was a time where you go into any earnings briefing and the firm says, oh, I only have one day of inventory on stock. And that firm will be cheered, right? Stock price will go up because you manage inventory very, very well. Now, if you say that, I think your stock price will be punished. Uh, you need to say, I have one month for inventory. And that gives investors the confidence that your supply chain, your manufacturing will not be disrupted. And you have visibility for your cash flow, for your revenue in the next one month. It's ironic, but this is a very different time. So, so I think uh, a very simple you know, heartfelt comment to, to all of you who runs firms out there is this. Uh, you know, every time you have a Fed hiking cycle, uh, everybody tries to guess what the Fed president is thinking, Fed chair is thinking, what Janet Yellen, you know, what uh, Jay Powell is thinking. Uh, are they really going to hike so much? You know, I think this is not the cycle to try to guess the Fed. Right. If you can hatch away your interest rate risks, if you can hatch away your currency risks, because you've got much more bigger worries out there, your supply chain. So, so this is not a year where you try to outsmart the Fed. No. If you hear from them, they're going to do 50-50 in June and July. Please hatch your interest rate risks and just ride along with that. There are much more bigger worries out there and uncertainties out there that you need to worry about. So that, that's my, my very simple two cents. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, Kunhai and Tony. I think on, on that note itself, right, uh, like, uh, while, while looking at the questions, right, I think it's also quite pertinent to say that there was a particular question from the audience saying that following the May announcement of 50 bips hike, right, uh, and I think that's, this is also on the minds of many investors I, uh, that I've been speaking to as well, would you see the, re the recent stock market uh, drops right, as a sign of capitulation? Or actually, it's actually going to be a beginning of a bear market that we are entering, aka we are looking into you know staring into recession. Uh, and I think we, we couldn't. Uh, I think we we have come to the point where probably we, we shouldn't be avoiding the R word in a sense. But uh, I'll just put it out there to to the both of you to probably tackle this difficult question as well. Yeah. So let me let me start off by saying yeah I, I think that I think it's an interesting question. Uh, we've been spending time in our morning meetings debating. Um, uh, since the FOMC's uh, rate hike, uh, markets have been really selling off quite hard. And uh, I, I do. I think our personal view, even though it's very hard to read, is is that it does seem like those who are holding out hope that the the strong growth would eventually support markets that they were capitulating. It seemed like uh, if you had looked at overall fund managers' positioning. Fund managers on the whole were still either overweight or neutral equities um, at this point. And I think most, I think you had more and more just throwing the towel saying we just need to get underweight. Um, the, it's going to take more time before things get worked out. So I, I was tempted to think that this does look like capitulation. But the, the other side of that question was, well, is this the start of a bear market? I mean, in fact, is, you know, I think most bear markets, they, they use this 20% down definition. We're getting close to that. And um, and I, I don't think I would really rule that out. I, I, I think what I would focus on, though, is really just how hard is this going to be in the real economy? And um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that a slowdown of some sort is pretty reasonable, maybe even uh, a, 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 we call it a recession with negative growth. But I, I don't think this is really a painful recession like you would have had in like 2008, where you just have such deep problems that... Um, uh, that it takes a long time for growth to resume. Uh, what we need right now is just the world to produce enough cars and enough houses, and then then things can get back to normal. So, so just just to add to this, um, I know it's a very hot potato, right? Uh, bear market, recession, or even stagflation, right? 
uh, everybody's you know, uh, contemplating the risk of any of these very scary outcomes. Um, I think we're still early days here in this economic cycle. Um, and, and it's worth highlighting that nobody out there is forecasting recession in the US. Uh, our forecast is still a 3% growth for the US at the very least this year. And that's a very good, healthy number. And, and you know, the, think of it this way. It is good that, that Jay Powell has come clean. It is good that the Fed has started to get very aggressive, you know, in the rate hikes. You'd rather that they do it now, you know, take the we take the markets, take the medicine now to control inflation. Then, you know, if they're really slow and they get they hit us much more later in the year. So if they can generate a soft landing with as what Tony says, minimal slowdown to the real economy, that has to be good. And, and I think the verdict objectively is still out whether you know, uh, things will go very wrong or whether the Fed is able to generate a soft landing. I, I still tend to believe that they will still be able to generate some form of a reasonable economic landing uh, that doesn't cause too much hurt to the job market, you know, to the real economy. So, so we are not seeing that right. Thanks a lot, Kunhan and, and Tony. I guess that also addresses some of the questions that were being raised as well, uh, relating to recession, relating to the bear market as well. Uh, I, I think there's the other point that uh, Kunhan, you mentioned in terms of uh, the world, in terms of uh, rising interest rates, right, uh, from some of the central banks that we have seen. You mentioned a couple of the central banks have raised, uh, have high rates as well. But on the other end, um, we have also seen China trying to maintain the easing policy. So it, with the disparity on the central bank action itself, right, versus what the rest of the world is adopting, I'm sorry. So, so what is our view in terms of how, how do we see this or, or is going to be a mashup of the different central banks doing their own stuff? And then would that also help in terms, I think one point they brought up uh, would lead to the certain growth that we are seeing in ASEAN as well, because as being the RCP hub itself, that would also help us in terms of uh, whatever that Asia is doing versus what the rest of the world, the Euro and what the US are doing, which is hiking rates and all that. But does it bodes well in terms of uh, where we sit right now in, in Asia and also in ASEAN as well? So, so chi China is in a, a, how should I say, a, a groove on its own, right? Uh, economy is slowing down and it's still technically you know locked down in terms of travel because of COVID-19 and so on and so forth. So yes, the central bank is easing monetary policy expected to cut LPR and potentially triple R if growth slows down further. I think that is good because there are many levers for the Chinese authorities, whether it's economic uh, uh, policies, mac uh, monetary policies, fiscal policies to push to basically stabilize the economy. Right. So, so think about it this way. Uh, the, the rate cuts that potentially may come in China uh, are not going to be disruptive or negative for our sink of the world. I think it's a good balancing act that will stabilize Chinese growth and help anchor the region. So balancing off you know, uh, all the rate hikes that's happening elsewhere. Now, Tony. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. I had to say, um, um, you know, currently we, we're still pretty cautious on China. The equity markets have been very complicated. Um, there, a lot of the the policies to try to control excessive lending has resulted in turbulence in the property markets and the bond markets accordingly. And so we're still a little bit cautious about that. But you know, things that Kunhan were pointing out, and just the fact that, um, as you mentioned, Roger, that their policies are easing, where the rest of the world is tightening. Um, and the fact that uh, there are already signs that if you track activity um, uh, measures that show well, what their path of reopening is, they, 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 they do look like they're getting to the worst of their, their closures. Mm -hmm. And so if it reopens, uh, they, there is some signs that they're getting less strict on all these clampdowns regarding lending and so forth. And uh, if they're cutting interest rates when other countries are raising interest rates, that, that could end up stabilizing China. It could even be an outperformer by the end of the year. But um, that's, that's still conceptual right now. For, uh, for, for now, we're still dealing with the fact that uh, both the equity and the fixed income markets for, for China are still very volatile. 
Thanks, thanks, uh, Tony, and also Kuna. Probably another question. I think uh, this is more towards uh, Tony. I guess just now you mentioned about you know when looking at the positivity uh, from how the markets have grown, right? Uh, and then you're talking about the bond yields, especially uh, rising in terms of three to four percent for IG, and also very good names and all that. So, so it, in this kind of environment, I guess that the questions were uh, were actually asking you know will government bonds, IG corporate bonds, or even high yield bonds, will actually be perform better in this environment? What, what's your take on that? So I, I do think they can perform. Um, they do need these, this fierce period of interest rate hikes to slow down a little bit, or actually, I mean, a lot is already priced into the, the bond yields, but um, the close we get to sort of a peak on that, then these bond yields are really good and they'll start to perform. And on top of that, if, if this growing market fear is right, that eventually there'll be um, that all these Fed rate hikes are going to slow down the economy and even bring up the risk of recession. At that point, bond yields probably not only peak, they probably ease off a bit. And then returns on bond funds could be very healthy. So uh, I, I, I think um, it's been sort of a miserable start to the year, but I wouldn't completely ignore the asset class. Uh, I, would, I would start to build up a little bit. Um, we're currently doing that uh, in a lot of our strategies. Um, we're still trying to hedge the interest rate to a fair degree, but we're trying to get more and more of these attractively yielding bonds in our portfolios. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Probably just to have one uh, final question, right? In terms of, okay, I think there's another question coming up from here. Uh, given the clear contrasting financial situation against the low and negative interest rate and the low inflation that we're facing and the current direct opposite direct conditions in that sense, where is the easy trade given where we are early in the change market psychology? I think this is quite an interesting question. Yeah, so, so probably just, just to sum it up is that I think the, 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 the audience uh, from, uh, is asking about, you know, it's quite a clear contrasting financial situation and against the lower and negative interest rate. And then also at the same time with the low inflation coming in, right? So is there any, in, in, the, in the audience uh, words, right? Is there any easy trade out there in the market or uh, do we need to, you know, uh, what, what, what should we be looking for in, in that sense when we are in the, quite in the early, uh, in the change market psychology? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll start first with this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, let me just, you know, hawk our, our forecast a little bit. Um, clearly, uh, in this environment, this, this is a strong US dollar environment, right? So I would think the easy trade or the trend, right, is still for, you know, the strong US dollar to continue or some will say king dollar to continue to, to rule, right? So don't fight that strong dollar trend until you get much more clarity that the Fed will go easy on interest rates. So that's, that's the first point. Uh, the second thing is, uh, if you've been following our forecast, we have a very, uh, how should I say, warm you know, spot for, for gold. We love gold. We think gold will do well in this uncertainty because every time there's an economic rebalancing, volatility in financial markets, gold will be front and center as a safe haven asset. And, and it is, other than U.S. Treasuries, it is the only other asset that central banks across the world holds, right? Um, if you look at year-to-date returns of practically every asset, I think you'll be hard-pressed to find any asset that has a flat return even. Let's forget about positive return. Uh, lo and behold, gold is flat this year since the beginning of the year. We were at 1850 at the start of the year. We're now at 1850. And it's boring, right? But it is a good preservation of wealth because everything else has corrected significantly. So, so perhaps, you know, uh, you can diversify a little bit of portfolio into gold uh, just to, to, you know, buffer the downside a little bit and that may not be a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, Tony, sorry I interrupted you. No, I think that that's good. I, I, I agree with those uh, diversifying elements. Um, and and I, I guess I, I was also Look, rereading the question, I would just say, I would also highlight that the economy actually is really repricing everything very quickly. So while the question's right that, uh, you know, the Fed funds rate is still very low, they've only just started to adjust interest rates. But for the real economy, everything's already adjusted. I mentioned mortgage rates before, they're already higher than we've seen in a decade. Um, the real economy is dealing with uh, higher rates already. And as a bond investor, I could get those. And um, 
And I think what'll be interesting over these coming months is how the economy withstands all these sharp moves in, in lending rates and so forth that, that have adjusted so quickly. Great. Uh, I think that pretty sums up as well. I was, my, my, actually, my last question was supposed to, to you know, ask the both of you to have at least, you know, what are the three key takeaways uh, from this session? But I guess that question kind of summarizes uh, what Kunal has mentioned in terms of looking at goals and, and also looking in terms of where we are. And also Tony also summed up a little bit in terms of that as well. So uh, with that, in the interest of time, uh, we have come to the end of today's session. Unfortunately, we can't answer all the questions, but uh, you know, as a team, uh, UBAM uh, digital team itself, we will actually uh, we'll follow up as well. And uh, probably uh, just one final uh, ending note is also to, to highlight that, you know, given what the situation is right now, I guess, uh, and as always, again, trying to remind everyone that there's never been the best time to go into the market. It's always about the time in the market. So if with that, right, uh, we have started our regular savings plan using the eGyro feature. So do take a look out on that. And uh, yeah, I think that's all for today. Thank you for your participation and then you know, have a great uh, day ahead as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, thanks, Kunhan as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks don't everyone. forget your hot cup of coffee at the <laughs> yes. start of the page. <laughs> Take care, everyone.